Hello again in Rio. Again, let me apologize once more for not being able to be there, but I'm very fortunate they've allowed me to give these videos, and this is the second talk. What I'm gonna to discuss today is trials, clinical trials that are done, they're randomized, looking at usual care. And these are important clinical trials to try to see if what we do usually can be improved upon. Now the title of this talk, Therapeutic Misalignment, Potential Impact on Trials of Existing Therapies in Critical Illness, is very complicated. And I'm gonna give you an example of what I mean by therapeutic misalignment. But before I do that, let me emphasize the relevance of this and how this new area of research and usual care and what usual care represents and how to study it has been controversial and full of controversy. This is the New York Times, and it's from last year in the New York Times, and it is the front page article in the most important part in the upper left-hand corner, the most important star story, and it's the controversy is over a study of usual care where they took premature infants within the range that normally is studied, they narrowed the range to a very low range of oxygen saturation that they aim to keep children in versus a very high oxygen range where they kept children in, all within the range that is normally used. And this caused controversy because they did not inform them of the risks that were in the trial, which was death and blindness. And they found that there was a significant increase in both. And the reason they didn't feel that they needed to was because the trial was within the realm of usual care. And what they said, and this is now in the, a few days later, and again this prestigious journal, the New York Times, and it's by the editorial board. And they say that what they did was wrong in this trial, and they felt they didn't have to inform them of these risks because everything was within the realm of usual care. But what they pointed out in the editorial is that if a baby had been normally given a high level of oxygen in the study, the event might randomly receive a lower level in this study. So what am I talking about? How do you explain this to me? What does this mean? Well, it's misalignment. And even though something is within the range of usual care, that doesn't mean it's the way it was given in usual care to that specific population. And let me give you the example that I told you of therapeutic misalignment. And hopefully this will bring to life what I'm gonna be trying to explain when I go through two randomized trials, which were seminal trials of usual care, and have the same problem. So this is an imaginary study. No one would ever do it. And it's a study of using vasopressors and septic shock. Nobody would do it because they understand the relationship between giving vasopressors and outcome. But let's just do the study because it exemplifies the misalignment problem. So we're randomizing people to two different infusion rates, a low infusion rate of pressors and a high infusion rate. And the argument goes something like this. People use low infusion rates and people use high infusion rates. So they're all used within usual care. So let's see if one is better than the other. Normally in usual care, we titrate them. But now we're gonna do it independent of need because there's no data to suggest one dose is better than the other. This is our population that I made up with different levels of shock. There are some patients with moderate shock, 40 to 50. There are some people with severe shock, their blood pressures are 40. And some people with mild shock, their blood pressure is 55 to 60. And we're gonna randomize patients from this normal distribution of patients to the two arms in our study. Let's start in yellow with the low dose vasopressor. Who's gonna get misaligned and have the problem? It's the people with severe septic shock. You're giving them an inadequate dose. Normally you would titrate it, and they're gonna still have severe shock. Now let's go to the high dose arm shown in red. The people with mild shock are gonna get in trouble. They're going to have been given too much pressor and be hypertensive with heart function that's dysfunctional and get into trouble. And what I'm gonna argue with you today is your whole study is gonna be determined by which is worse, giving too much vasopressor to patients that are in mild shock 
are giving too little vasopressor to people that are in severe shock, and all you're determining is which is worse of two therapies you normally would never do. So let me now give you the outline of the talk, since hopefully I've now explained to you what therapeutic misalignment means. Tra therapies are normally titrated, and you eliminate the titration and move patients to ranges of treatment they normally wouldn't get. I'm gonna discuss the problem a little bit more in detail, and then discuss two trials, the Transfusion Trigger Trial and the ARDSNET, both published in the New England Journal of Medicine, both seminal trials that have the misalignment problem. And I discussed the support study, but I'm not gonna go through that today, and I'm then in the end gonna discuss potential ways of preventing this problem. Therapeutic misalignment in studies of usual care. It's giving the wrong dosage or prescription. It's opposite to what you would normally do. It has potential for serious consequences because these are critically ill patients and changing their care in somebody who is severely ill can have serious consequences on morbidity and mortality. What trials are at high risk for this problem? Life-sustaining interventions adjusted for severity of disease, oxygen therapy and premature infants, blood transfusion, ventilator management. All these are titrated therapies. You test two ends of routine care. Is care is changed independent of need and there's no routine practice control. So why do we need controls in studies? Well, it provides a more effective safety monitoring. Essentially, if you have an increase in morbidity and mortality, if you have no control, how can you monitor it if you have two treatment effects? It allows for valid comparisons of changing current practice. If you know you're better than usual care with one of your arms, then you know that with security, you're improving care, not worsening care. But it does not eliminate the potential for therapeutic misalignment. So from here on in, I'm not gonna discuss controls anymore until the end of the talk. All I'm gonna discuss is the problem of therapeutic misalignment. Routine care and critical illness. Critical illnesses vary in severity. Treatment is frequently adjusted based on the severity. Severity of illness and treatment levels are often linked. Now the basis for the link is not a randomized controlled trial. It's physiologic. We use physiologic endpoints and base these treatments on physiologic therapies trying to normalize things. It's a physiologic response to an intervention. It's immediate, it's reproducible. It has physiologic rationale. The blood pressure is too low. Ventilation is inadequate, we try to normalize it. And we know where there are harmful effects. We know that too much blood pressure, too little is bad. We know that too high airway pressure, too low. We have preclinical data. We have shared clinical experiences. So there's a lot of data and experience that goes into usual care, particularly in the intensive care unit with critically ill patients. Now, you'll argue that therapy differs. It does differ across here in Brazil, across the United States, but it doesn't differ that much. Somebody with mild illness will usually get a low level of treatment, some will give a mid-range. Somebody with moderate will usually get a mid-range treatment in most places, some will give a low and some will give a high, and most of the time people with severe illness will get a high level of treatment, but some will get a mid-range. But what randomization, if you're not careful, can make you do is take somebody with mild disease and give them a high treatment, which everyone knows is wrong. Any randomization makes you do it, but if any clinician looking at it would say, I would never do that. Or take somebody with severe disease and give them a low level of treatment. And your physiologic endpoints tell you that's wrong because you're inadequately perfusing or you're causing damage in some way. Now let's discuss the transfusion trigger trial not in terms of how it was published in the New England Journal, but let's discuss it in terms of the misalignment problem. Now the first important thing for you to understand is they took 840 critically ill patients. And those critically ill patients had nothing going on. There was nothing wrong. They were just in the intensive care unit. It was surgical intensive care units in Canada and things were going along fine. They were euvolemic, they were not bleeding and they randomized them to two arms, a restrictive arm and a liberal arm. And what they said was is, 
In the restrictive arm, they would not transfuse blood unless the hemoglobin fell below seven. And this is important for you to understand. In the liberal arm, they said, if your hemoglobin is not 10, we're gonna give you blood for no reason. And if it falls below 10, we'll give you blood. And they maintained them seven to nine or 10 to 12. And they found that the liberal arm increased mortality, hospital mortality came to the restrictive. It's not the primary endpoint, but it's the endpoint people discuss. And they recommended critical patients receive red cell transfusions when hemoglobin concentrations fall below seven grams per deciliter. Is the conclusion justified and applicable to all critically ill patients? Well, you have to understand what was routine care or routine practice at the time of the trial. So the physicians in Canada actually did a survey. And in this survey, they asked physicians in Canada what their practice was. And now in the next few slides, I'm gonna show you data from that survey. In terms of hemoglobin thresholds, the physicians in Canada said if you had a young, stable trauma patient, they'd let the hemoglobin fall to eight before they transfuse. But in an older bleeding patient, they would transfuse much earlier. They wouldn't let the hemoglobin fall below nine and a half. And these were the things that changed their care. Age, preoperative status, hypoxemia, Apache score, shock, lactic acidosis, coronary ischemia. When these things were evident, they would transfuse earlier and it was highly significant. So they also gave the clinician scenarios and asked them what hemoglobin they would transfuse at. And if you had a 55-year-old after major surgery who has ischemic heart disease, what they said was is that most of the patients in this study, they would transfuse if the hemoglobin fell to nine. And, but some would go lower and some would go higher. But what you found was that less than 3% used what you're gonna study. That is almost nobody would let somebody with coronary disease go down to 3%. And this is what we're worried about is the misalignment and that these patients are gonna get in trouble. Another scenario they gave you was a 24 year old after multiple trauma and his hemoglobins were maintained at normally what they said was they wouldn't transfuse unless it fell to eight, much lower or seven. Now in this arm, what we're worried about is only 12%, a small percentage, use one as high as 10 in a young, healthy patient. Now, this is what I alluded to at the start of the talk and what we're worried about. If, let's say, your hemoglobin is seven, who has a hemoglobin of seven? Well, an obstetric patient who has a C-section who has bleeding, the anesthesiologist is gonna have them come out of the operating room, euvolemic, with a hemoglobin of seven, because they believe the risk of blood is more than being maintained at a hemoglobin of seven. If that patient gets randomized to this trial at a hemoglobin of seven, a euvolemic, they're gonna require a lot of blood if they get randomized to the liberal arm for no reason. And that's the population we're worried about is the young healthy group that are normally maintained at low hemoglobins. So now let's look at this trial based on whether you had ischemic heart disease or not and which transfusion trigger to see if the misalignment problem is, is effective. So in non-ischemic patients, the result is as the overall trial. The ones with the restrictive did better with the liberal. But now let's look at the ischemic heart patients. They had a significant different and opposite effect. They did significantly worse if they had been given a restrictive as opposed to a liberal. Now, why did patients die in this arm in the liberal arm? What happened? Well, they actually tell you in the clinical trial. They present the data. And in the next slide, I'm gonna show you data from the New England Journal paper. In the liberal arm, mortality increased in the low Apache, the less sick, and in the younger patients, less than 55 years old. So here is the full change in mortality in the liberal versus restrictive arm. It's the low Apache score of patients that had the two-fold increase in the liberal arm. The higher ones had no difference. It's the younger patients that had the two-fold increase in mortality in the liberal versus the restrictive. 
not the older. So a restrictive transfusion limits an oxygen carrying capacity and delivery. It may lead to inadequate perfusion and ischemic disease. In the liberal transfusion arm, there was a significant increase in pulmonary, cardiopulmonary events. People were doing things you normally don't do, transfusing people with uvular patients with blood. They had pulmonary edema, significant increase, ARDS, myocardial infarctions. They got a lot of blood, five units plus or minus the standard error five. Their hemoglobins were kept relatively high. So physicians really routinely base transfusion thresholds on age, Apache 2 score, ischemic heart disease, and shock. Randomization to fixed thresholds resulted in therapeutic misalignments. Both therapeutic misalignments increase patient risk but different mechanisms in each arm. Comparison of arms with different therapeutic misalignments is uninformative. Titrated care representing routine practice was not used to monitor safety or as a basis to change practice. Well, the General Accounting Office in the United States estimates that the risk of deaths from a unit of blood is something in the order of one in 10,000. Now these may not be the same population, but there's a two-fold increase in mortality of the risk of blood when it's not traded in this trial. It shows you how much changing care and taking people with coronary disease and restricting them, taking young healthy people and doing things you never really do in critically ill populations can affect outcome. The next study I'm gonna discuss is the ArsNet Network. It's a consortium of academic centers sponsored by the NIH, where I also work, developed to perform clinical trials in patients with the adult respiratory distress syndrome, a form of lung injury, acute lung injury. There were three trials done with this basic design. One was a low versus high tidal volume, another was a low versus high PEEP, and another was a low versus high amounts of fluids. And this is the trial that had the controversial result that I'm gonna discuss. They found that a low tidal volume was significantly beneficial compared to a high tidal volume. And they recommended that this lower tidal volume protocol should be used in patients with acute lung injury with acute respiratory distress syndrome. The question is, is the conclusion justified and applicable to all ARDS patients? Again, I think you need to understand what was routine practice at the time of the trial in order to answer this question. Now, I can't tell you what was routine practice based on anything except studies that look back at that time and describe what was done, and that's the data I'm gonna show you. So this is a study from Minnesota, 400 patients with ARDS. And what they show you is, is that as lung injury score increased, that is, chest x-rays were worse and blood gases were worse, which goes into this score, physicians lowered tidal volume. And these are means and standard error, standard deviations. And there's a dramatic, highly significant decrease. And this was at the same time that they were enrolling patients in this trial. This is another set of data that was taken by Esteban in Madrid. He called hospitals in North America, South America, North Africa, all around the world, and over two weeks asked them what were the ventilator settings. And what they found was is that compliance, as it decreased, that means the lung is stiffer and usually more damaged, physicians around the world lowered tidal volumes. So routine management of tidal volumes worldwide was in patients with more severely injured non-compliant lungs, their tidal volumes were reduced. So what was routine care in the ArtsNet group, these 10 hospitals in the United States? Was it similar to what was done worldwide? These are 500 patients from that clinical trial. I was given the data from the clinical trial by the Office of Human Research Protections. And these are 500 patients, pre-randomization, before they're in the trial, this is usual care. What was practice? Well, it was the same as it was worldwide. That is, as lungs became stiffer, more damaged, physicians lowered tidal volumes significantly. Now, in order to analyze the data differently, that is with the misalignment problem, I need to find out which one of these areas on this curve are 
where physicians managed high tidal volumes and had compliant lungs and where physicians used low tidal volumes and non-compliant. So I did an analysis where I said, a simple analysis where I said, ask the computer, independent of me, to just model the data and give me a model. And what the computer came up with was this, that there is a moderate relationship between lung compliance and tidal volume. And here, physicians didn't care what tidal volumes were. They didn't change them. But when you got to this level of compliance, physicians in these 10 hospitals began markedly lowering tidal volumes. And here are the confidence intervals. There's a, 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 not, not very predictable, but as you get to the sicker lungs, physicians were fairly consistent in what they did. So I'm going to take this data now and ask, is there a change point? I'm going to do a statistical test again, just say, is there anywhere in this data a change point where I can divide it? And what you find is, is at point six, there's a highly statistically significant change point. And below six, physicians lower tidal volumes and lungs are more non-compliant. And above point six, there's higher tidal volumes and they're more compliant lungs. So now I'm going to divide this data up and see what happened to the low tidal volume, low compliance patients that were randomized to a lower high arm, and what happens to the high tidal volume, high compliance patients, and what happened to them in terms of outcome if they're randomized to a high or low arm. But first let me show you this data, the same data, the low arm and the high arm, using a normal Gaussian curve to see how many patients are in the low and how many patients are in the arm, high arm, and use the same color distribution. And that's what you see on sound here. And you see that most of the patients in this trial had low tidal volumes and non-compliant lungs, and only a third about had high tidal volumes and high compliant lungs. And now I'm going to randomize these people. This is their pre-randomization data. In order to randomize them, I'm going to divide them into two groups to see what happened to each group in terms of mortality, and I'll place circles around them, and put them up here in the upper hand corner and randomize them separately and show you what happened to them each one. First, let's take the low tidal volume, low compliance group, and randomize them here to six or 12 mLs per kilo as they did in the study. And what you half got one, half got the other. And what you found is that patients with non-compliance, more severely injured lungs that were receiving six to 10 mLs per kilo had their volume increase two to six mLs per kilo to be in the 12 mL per kilo arm. In a 70 kilogram patient, this means an increase in volume of 140 to 420 mLs. No one would do this. This is a misalignment problem. And no one would take a patient on a ventilator who's doing well and increase their tidal volume up to 400 mLs. Let's take the other arm now, that the more compliant patients with receiving higher tidal volumes and randomize them to six or 12 mLs per kilo and see what happens here. Here, the 12 mL per kilo is close to what they were normally getting. What happened to them when they got six? Patients with more compliant, less severely injured lungs receiving 11 to 15 mLs per kilo had their volumes decrease five to nine mLs to be in the six mL per kilo arm. In a 70 kilogram patient, this means a decrease in volume of 350 to 600 mLs. No one would do this. And I've seen the data safety monitoring reports and the patients were complaining of starvation, they couldn't breathe, their, their breathing was impossible, and all that was written was either we paralyzed them more, um, or we changed the tidal volume. Nobody thought of changing uh, what was being studied. So now let's look at the overall outcome based on whether your tidal volume was lower or raised. In the lower pulmonary compliance group, if you were lowered, which was more what usual care was, your mortality was 25 to 30 percent. But if you were raised, which was opposite to routine care, your mortality was 40 to 45. In the high compliance arm, it was the opposite. The high compliance arm, which are less sick lungs usually, they had a low mortality, but if you, raise, if you lowered their tidal volume to six mLs per kilo, you markedly increased their mortality. And this result is statistically significant and opposite. And unchanged if corrected for age, Apache, or the level of lung injury. It's a highly significant result. And it shows you that usual care was pretty correct because the patients got closest to usual care had the lowest mortality. And those that they change usually care had a marked increase where they ignored titrated care. 
So physicians routinely adjust title of IM based on surrogate measures of loan compliance. Randomization to either of two set values resulted in therapeutic misassignment. This placed some patients at increased risk and weakened study conclusions. I told you in the beginning I was going to return to why we need controls. We needed to monitor serious adverse events and critical illness. Critical illness, critical care is a very special new field of research with a very different problem than most other fields of research. It's unique to critical care. We have a high signal to noise ratio. There's substantial back trauma mortality. Mortality is expected. Multiple organ injury is common. And these are the toxicities that you're gonna find in the trial that are gonna be increased. And you're not gonna be able to differentiate them from usual care without some kind of control to compare it to. What do I mean? Well, if you gave human growth hormone to somebody of short stature in a clinical trial, and they died, you'd stop the trial. But they actually did a trial in critically ill patients, surgical patients, where they were giving total parental nutrition, and they gave half of them human growth hormone. And the mortality was doubled, but they never stopped the trial. They didn't have a data safety monitoring board. And the p-value had 11 zeros in front of it, eight or 11, I can't remember, it doesn't matter. It was a highly significant result. And over 250 patients, it can be concluded, died needlessly because they didn't stop the trial early. There is no knowing what's going on unless you have a comparator arm. Now, to convince you of this, let me put you on the data safety monitoring board. Every clinical trial, multi-center like this, has a data safety monitoring board. Let me put you, the audience here in Brazil, on the data safety monitoring board and show you what they saw as the trial was progressing and show you what they might have seen had they had approximately a control and would it have changed your mind. After 200 eligible patients were enrolled in the ARDSNET low tidal volume trial, the data I just showed you, the mortality in the 6 ml per kilo arm was about 28% and in the 12 ml per kilo was about 45% and the p-value was 003. Now, they adjust the p-value and require more statistical significance to stop. And they do this because they want to not have two, they, you have to give up some of your p-value to maintain your p-value at the end. And so, what the people on Data Safety Monitoring Board said was we didn't reach the stopping rule and nobody's getting hurt because they're getting a control. Tidal volume, 12 ml per kilo, usual care, and we want to prove for sure if the 6 ml per kilo is benefit. As you went along, 450 patients still didn't meet a stopping rule, 600 did not, but at 800 patients they met a stopping rule and they stopped the trial. And they had the statistically significant result. Now, I said to you I don't have a real control, but I have something that is an approximation that may be fairly good. During this trial, at these 10 centers, patients that were eligible, eligible for the trial, that is, that would have been eligible for the trial, but were excluded for very uh, non-important reasons, they followed them along at the same hospitals, treated by the same physicians, getting usual care. And there's about 2,500 of these. So these 2,500 patients treated at the same hospitals, met entry criteria for this study, and were getting the same care by the same physicians, the same hospitals, what was their mortality? Was it close to 12 mLs per kilo? No, it was about 31%, close to the 6 mL per kilogram arm. Now, if you were on the data safety monitoring board and you saw that your control was increasing mortality by 50% and your test arm was almost the same as current practice, would you continue that trial? I don't think so. And now, having had a current practice control, it would change how you would have ran that trial. But before I continue, let me try to convince you that this is a reasonable approximation by the argument that I gave you in my previous talk of consistency. Let's look at what were the exclusion criteria, why these people getting current practice were excluded. Well, 91 shouldn't have been excluded. They should have been in the trial. It's unclear why they were excluded. And they have a mortality of about 28%, pretty close to the six. 
There were 30 patients, there were 198 who were enrolled in other trials, their mortality was about 30%. 296 of these, the patients refused enrollment, their mortality is pretty close. Another 355 patients were unable to give consent. Their mortality is close to 30%. This is the most interesting group. 445 of the physicians who saw what was going on in this trial refused to enroll their patients. Their patients were willing to enroll, but they said they wouldn't let them in the trial. It's the second largest group. And 1,189 patients, you had to meet inclusion criteria within 36 hours. They had been already in on ventilation for more, more than 36 hours, so they were excluded. But it looks like a pretty consistent approximation of what was usually care. So what did they prove in this trial? The Office of Human Research Protections subjects will be best served by further discussion within the scientific community and the bioethics community about appropriate research design in the absence of standard of care. I think the critical issue is in these trials of usual care, is to study routine care before you're designing the trial. Determine what ranges are used clinically. Identify characteristics associated with different levels of treatment. And in terms of the very first study, the support study that I discussed with you, that was the problem. They did not understand the, uh, the review board that approved the trial, that one of the two arms of that study was something that no one would use in usual care. And they weren't studying two arms which were similar to usual care. One of the arms was very different and they needed to give informed consent about the risk of mortality and blindness. But you really need the IRB to demand to know how usual care is run, what are the characteristics, which type of patients get minimal, which type of patients get maximal therapy. And then you've got to simulate a randomization to identify if there's misalignments. But if one of your arms is very different, as it was in the support study, it was in all the arms in the studies I showed you, you have to have a control. You have to have a control to monitor safety. You have to have a control to make conclusions. Unless you can really prove to an IRB that the two arms are identical to usual care and represent two arms of usual care that are commonly used by more than 30-40% of people, you really do need to have a control. And you have to consider if it's reasonable and formative to assign patients only given one level therapy in one. Even if it, you don't think it's reasonable, and I think you can actually go ahead and do that study where one of the arms is different than usual care, but if you do do that, you have to have a control. You have to be monitoring safety and you have to give informed consent that you're doing something that is very different and you have to discuss the risks and why physicians would not normally use that or would use that. So I think there are trial designs at present that can prevent this problem when we're studying usual care, these unique trials, particularly usual care and critical illness. We, should, we can include an arm that represents routine care. That makes things simple. Uh, then you don't really have to absolutely 100% document that both arms are either usual care or how they change usual care. Or if you find that you're uh, studying one arm that has very one isolated range, restrict the whole study to that range and compare it to usual care. Or you can study two different ranges that are used to stratify, have different controls. Or you can just change the titration method or use an adaptive design where you adjust the study, the control, to represent usual care throughout the trial. So in conclusion, what I tried to emphasize to you about studies of usual care is the therapeutic misassignment problem, which really is, do you really understand how those therapies within usual care are given and to which patients and for what reason? If there are therapeutic misassignments, uh, misassignments it can increase risks and lead to incorrect conclusions and recommendations. Routine care arms are necessary if the arms really are not representative. And they're necessary to monitor safety and make valid conclusions. And we need to have safeguards. We really absolutely have to do pre-trial studies to determine how these trial, how these therapies that are within usual care are used and document if they really are being studied in the trial after being used and IRBs need to enforce this. And we need to use alternative trial designs in order to make sure there are controls, 
or if we're studying two arms that are routine care, that those routine care arms throughout the trial are managed as they would be during routine care. Thank you.